Great to be here. I first want to thank uh, Jim Doty for the wonderful invitation to come and uh, learn from so many of you and all the folks who have hosted this Compassion Meeting. I feel like um, it's been such an such a intellectual feast, um, and that's very much continued this morning, so I appreciate that. Um, we were asked to give little tidbit introductions. Um, the official story is I'm a faculty member at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, how I, th I thought I'd focus on how I got to be studying this uh, work to begin with. And um, very much, I'm uh, primarily an emotion scientist. And I see myself as, you know, having been minding my own business as an emotion scientist, trying to study my uh, particular theory on positive emotions, the broaden and build theory uh, of positive emotions. And I got, you know, a couple, uh, several years working on the broaden part and turned to trying to figure out the build part, which is the real, you know, the, the real kicker of the theory is, um, so what happens if people increase their daily diet of positive emotions? How does that change them. And uh, I'd had uh, a number of ideas. I was like, oh, I'll create an intervention based on the science of finding positive meaning, and that should elicit, you know, based on appraisal theory, that should work to in increase people's positive emotions, and had um, two or three really humbling failed interventions um, that convinced me that changing people's emotional habits is not something that, uh, you know, you just waltz in and do as an experimental social psychologist. And uh, fortunately at that time, I was part of a faculty uh, seminar at University of Michigan run by Rita Ben on integrative medicine. And that's where I first encountered loving kindness meditation. And um, at that point I thought, this could be tremendous, I could use this ancient technique sculpted over millennia instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. And so it off, I, I um, got into this work also very much at the time inspired by Mind and Life. I, I um, attended the MIT meeting and it was around the time that Richie Davidson's work with John Kabat-Zinn was just taking off and that emboldened me to think that yes, a social psychologist can study meditation to test theory. So that's how I got involved in this. Um, You'll notice that uh, all of my slides talk about love and um, not, they don't use the word compassion. Um, and I just want to say at the start that, I, um, I, that this is the case in part because I've been studying loving kindness meditation in particular, but in part because I um, very much resonated with a perspective that was reflected here best in Jimpa's um, talk where uh, the idea that love and compassion come from the same stem and that uh, uh, the, the way you phrased it, Jimpa, was really um, uh, uh, succinct, of holding the other as dear. And uh, I, th I think the difference between love and compassion um, is that that loving connection state, state, you hold the other as dear, and when you become aware that that person's full predicament involves suffering, then that, com then that love transforms into compassion. So there's a continuum of love, compassion, to sympathetic joy of when you get an assessment of what the person's full predicament is like. So I think there's a really um, a smooth transition to go between love and compassion. But I focus on love here. Um, let me, here we go. Uh, I just want to give a very short summary of um, why I care about positive emotions and moving towards some new theoretical um, hypothesizing I'm doing about love in particular. Positive emotions we know from um, um, a num number of laboratory studies in my lab and other labs expand people's awareness, broaden awareness, very much like uh, this water lily opens in response to sunlight. Our minds open in response to our experience of positive emotions. This has been shown in behavioral studies in my lab, in um, other labs with eye tracking and brain imaging. Um, I won't go into these studies, but just know that it's, uh, it's not just um, uh, a one-shop finding. Uh, consequences of this is that when people are experiencing positive emotions, they see more possibilities, they see more points of connection with other people. They're more likely to think in terms of we than in terms of me versus you. 
And in other work, we've shown that um, even things that tend to divide people, like racial and cultural differences, seem to slip out of view in those moments when people are experiencing positive emotions. Now, more recently, I've wanted to um, understand uh, more deeply what love as an emotion is. And remember, I'm an emotion scientist, so I'm approaching um, uh, love from a positive emotion perspective. And um, I, th I think it's useful because love is so um, often talked about. We hear about it on the radio all the time. We see it portrayed everywhere. Everybody's got um, their own definition of love. Um, I'm going to look at it from an uh, emotions angle. But I think it's useful to start with what love is not. Um, and one thing I would say is that love is not sexual desire. Um, it is not a special bond. It is not a commitment. It is not exclusive. And some of the more challenging things for people, I think love is not lasting. And perhaps most challenging of all, I think love is not unconditional. Um, and that is that um, our moments of love are very short-lived and they lawfully follow from certain preconditions that need to be in place. And so that's how I'm using un uh, not unconditional here. Um, just for emphasis, I know this is a little extreme, but just to help you <laughs> remember what love is not. Okay. So moving towards my um, uh, initial working definition for what love is, um, I'd like to argue that love is a interpersonally situated emotional experience marked by a momentary increase in a series of, of a, a, a trio of phenomena. The first is a shared positive emotional state. Not an identical positive emotional state, but uh, when two or more people are both experiencing a similar um, uh, both experiencing the same situation and experiencing some positivity in that. And that that um, produces a biobehavioral synchrony between people. They're, they're showing nonverbal synchrony and an internal synchrony, um, uh, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, from an emotions perspective, I think the action urge, the action tendency that goes with this is an urge for mutual care that the, the caring is not just in one direction, that when people are in this shared emotional state, there's each person is caring for the other person's uh, well-being. And over time, you'll see the, the pieces of the broaden and build theory in here, that these moments uh, of uh, shared positive emotion, biobehavioral synchrony, and mutual care build uh, the sense of embodied rapport, like that, that Subjective sense like, oh, we really clicked. We really uh, understood each other. Um, which those kind of moments can build um, over time into social bonds and loyalty and commitment. So these are things that these micro moments of shared connection between people uh, where posi shared positivity is um, a really potent part of it is what creates these longer term things that also go by the name love confusingly, um, the, the commitments and the social bonds. So another word for this that I am uh, like to coin here is positivity resonance, that these uh, moments when uh, the positivity resonance being defined by these three characteristics of shared positivity, biobehavioral synchrony, and mutual care is when the emotion is being experienced by a dyad or a larger group. So it, comes, it calls into question where does the emotion belong? Who owns the emotion? Well, neither of these people necessarily own the amusement or the love or the care uh, that's shown here. It's happening, it's distributed across um, the, the people involved. Now, to um, tackling the uh, question or the idea of love not being unconditional, I want to talk about the preconditions that support these micro moments of positivity resonance. And the first we've heard a bit about yesterday uh, is safety. It's just having this um, uh, momentary sense that this is a safe moment. That, I think, is a, a bedrock precondition for these micro, uh, micro moments of shared positivity to emerge. And we heard about this in um, uh, the talk on um, Gilbert's work. 
um, blanking on our speaker who spoke on that yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also in um, Steve Porges's, uh, uh talk as well. So we've had a lot, a lot of themes on um, uh, safety and how important that is. A second precondition I want to spend a little bit more time on is uh, connection. And here I mean um, uh, f embodied face-to-face -face connection um, that can, uh, physical co-presence of bodies. Uh, most significantly, eye contact, um, but I think also there's other forms of connection like touch and voice that can also um, make a big difference. Now, I'm going to um, drive in the next few slides towards a particular um, view of the function of smiles. So, and this is um, uh, a synthesis across a number of different researchers, but uh, I want to pay special um, uh, credit to uh, Paula Diedenthal's work on the simulation of smiles model, because it, it brought a number of neat ideas onto the table and uh, influenced my thinking here. Um, but there's one interesting new tidbit. Um, people have off, off, the literature has often said that angry faces pop out of a crowd and draw our attention. Well, there's some new work to suggest that actually when you control for all the methodological artifacts, it's positive uh, uh, smiles that pop out and grab people's attention and, um, uh, and uh, elicit eye contact in particular. And there's other work um, by researchers um, uh, that suggests, um, Schrammel and colleagues, to suggest that eye contact is uh, in a very important bedrock condition for facial mimicry to occur. That when people uh, view emotion uh, faces and do not, that aren't making eye contact um, with the observer, here's with avatars, there's no, no facial mimicry as um, picked up by facial EMG, but I, with eye contact there is. And that um, mimicry creates the opportunity for a neural synchrony, um, and I'm going to go through these really quickly because I'm just trying to get the sort of theory on the table, um, and that also creates an op opportunity for oxytocin synchrony, and here I'm um, referring to some work by uh, Ruth Feldman and her colleagues. And in my own lab, we've looked also at behavioral synchrony. Uh, yesterday, we heard from Dave DeSteno on um, orchestrated synchrony through, you know, orchestrating taps. Here we're looking at naturally occurring behavioral synchrony and how it predicts these moments of embodied rapport. And drawing from Paul and Edenthal's work, um, these moments where people sh uh, share a smile, share eye contact, um, that, that allows you to have a gut sense of what the other person is thinking, a gut sense of their motives, or what you might call intersubjectivity. Um, and this uh, fellow made an appearance yesterday in our uh, presentations. But you can think of these moments of positivity resonance as a miniature version of this mind meld where Spock would famously hold his hand up to the, the head of somebody and try to suck out the contents of their mind. Um, I think Spock had it wrong for two reasons. One, he's not making eye contact and there's no, there's no emotion here. Um, so here's a better picture from like a, a parent and a child, this idea of this positivity resonating between two, two beings. Um, there's eye contact, there's shared um, neural synchrony as well as um, uh, a, a physiological synchrony. So driving to this question of what is a smile for? Uh, what is the, how, why have smiles evolved? Uh, what is the function of a smile? There have been many different um, answers to this question over the years. Early on, coming out of Ekman and Friesen's famous work, was to express a, a partisan person's hidden emotional state. Uh, more recently, Bekarowski and Oren have said that, no, actually a smile is to evoke a particular emotional state in another. Um, now, from Niedenthal's work, you could argue that it's, well, you know, that sharing a smile um, creates this gut sense of what the other person is feeling, this embodied cognition. Um, David Sloan Wilson and one of his former students, um, Matt Gervais, um, uh, united a number of these, these ideas with Broaden and Build and argued that smiles and laughter, actually, broaden collective mindsets and build collective resources. And to this I would say, you know, all of these I think are true of smiles. They both express and evoke and they create this shared place. And I think that perhaps smiles uh, create this life-giving nutrient of positivity resonance. And I see I am 
um, running short on time, but I'm going to turn to measurements. Um, and what we found is that the heart's capacity for love varies. The physical heart's capacity for love varies, both between people and within each person over time. And uh, we had a wonderful talk by Steve Porges yesterday, and our work on the vagus nerve is very much inspired by his um, theorizing on the vagus as being central to the social engagement system. So I'm not going to um, give you too much detail there. We measure uh, the functioning or the health or the vigor of the vagus uh, with vagal tone which is uh, a very subtle arrhythmia in heart rate that's associated with breathing. So in our lab, we measure um, the ECG and respiration, and we compute uh, vagal tone as the change in um, heart rate associated with breathing. So uh, an increase in heart rate when, when you're breathing in and a decrease in heart rate as you're breathing out. Um, we also use... Um, uh, we, we compute this both as respiratory sinus arrhythmia and high-frequency heart rate variability. And using uh, measures like that, well, one thing I just want to mention real briefly is vagal tone is um, very important because it predicts um, uh, psychological well-being. Um, people with high vagal tone are known to um, have better abilities to regulate their attention, their emotions, they have better social skill. People uh, with high vagal tone are also better off in terms of physical health, in terms of cardiovascular health, glucose um, metabolism, inflammation. Um, if you uh, have a heart attack, if you have higher vagal tone, you have better odds of survival. So these are all good things about vagal tone. Vagal tone at rest is thought to be uh, quite stable after middle childhood. What we found is that... Um, in one study that people's uh, resting levels of vagal tone predicted how often they experience these moments of positivity connection or positivity resonance in daily life. Um, oh, zero, okay. Um, with your forgiveness, I'll keep going and make it quick, okay. Um, uh, so people with higher vagal tone experience more positivity resonance in daily life. But, more importantly, people who experience more positivity resonance in daily life three months later had higher vagal tone. And this is without any intervention whatsoever. Um, in our studies where we have um, done interventions, we've used loving-kindness meditation, we find that vagal tone measured at rest before we randomly assign people to um, uh, learn loving-kindness meditation predicts how well it, people are able to to benefit from it. The people with low vagal tone don't look any different than the people who didn't have a, a loving kindness workshop at all. They show no improvement in positive emotions where the people with the highest vagal tone show improvements. But more importantly, um, learning to self-generate um, these loving feelings through loving kindness meditation increases people's resting vagal tone. But you could, you could wonder whether this is about the breathing because we know that breathing might lead to changes in vagal tone. Maybe it has nothing to do with this positive emotion psychology. Um, what's been more important um, for our work is that um, this effect of learning loving kindness on changes in vagal tone was fully mediated by the day-to-day -day experience of positivity resonance or this, this warm, positive connection with people. Um, and if you're interested in the details of that work, I can share that um, offline. Uh, what's next? I won't go into this, but um, my collaborator Steve Cole is here. You'll hear from him this afternoon. We're looking at the effects of learning to self-generate love at a, a cellular level. Um, he's got some very interesting preliminary uh, work, not from our intervention studies. But just in closing, I want to mention, uh, just come back to a famous quote by Rumi. Um, he said that there's a way of breathing that is a shame and a suffocation. You kind of can feel that constriction there. And another way of breathing... He called it a love breath that lets you open infinitely. So I think um, Rumi was capturing a lot of what we're um, uh, focusing on here. So I want to thank my people and uh, let you know where you can learn more. I have a new book coming out uh, next spring, on, especially on this new love idea. So I, I, I beg your forgiveness on going over. So thank you for your kind attention.